Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. In a sea of words and text, we are naturally drawn to images online. The old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, is definitely true in digital marketing. Provided those images are relevant, well presented, and optimized for SEO. Today we have eight proven image SEO optimization secrets to boost your page rank. Ooh, I love secrets. And stuff that's proven? This is going to be awesome. This is Ryan Eldridge. And this is Andrea Eldridge. Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy. This is episode 17 of the Growth Marketer Academy podcast. I'm Ryan Eldridge, Chief Strategist at Squirrel Digital Marketing. And this is Andrea Eldridge, Creative Director at Squirrel Digital Marketing. Today, we're going to be talking about how to optimize your images on your pages so that they positively affect your SEO. When you add images to your pages, you need to consider not just how they impact user experience, but also how search engine crawlers will interpret them. So we've got this broken down. It's eight steps, but I hear from your uh, rendition of the segment plan that it's actually broken into two sections of four steps. So not to throw off any listeners, if you get like, wait, I thought we were on step number nine and we're really not. And be weird to be on step number nine in an eight step process. Yes, you're right. So um, let's talk first about optimizing images for user experience because Really, that's the primary motivation for adding images to your content. Yeah. Nobody wants to come across a piece of content that's just a big page full of text. Ain't nobody got time for that. Nobody's right. going to read, you know, 10,000 words without any images breaking it up. This right? is not a college dissertation, and yep. you don't get extra points for dense, uh, formally phrased yeah, and, and we've, we've mentioned it before that when you're online and you're seeing an article, you're generally, you, your general experience is to go in and scan the, the uh, document first before you decide whether or not you're going to read it. Yep. And if it's just a big, huge block of text, you're probably not going to be able to scan it very well, which means you're probably going to move on. That means yep. you're going to get a high bounce rate and not a lot of user dwell time on your page, and that is going to negatively affect your SEO. So Backlinko analyzed 1 million Google search results, and they found that content with at least one image significantly outperformed content without any images. Um, So even just adding one image makes a big difference. Interesting thing, though, adding additional images didn't influence rankings. So it's like just having at least one image gives that viewer or the person who stumbles across your page an instant expectation that, okay, so there's going to be some stuff that's interesting and stuff that I can process quickly. Yeah. And keep in mind, Google Google uh, rewards sites with a good, solid user experience. They're looking for pages that are useful. They don't want somebody to type in something in a search query, go to a page, figure out it's not what they want anyway, go back to the search results and do it again. That, right. to them, is a bad user experience. They want to one search result, go to one page, and, ah, I'm satisfied. And so the more often you can get somebody to, to stick to your page, page from one search query, the better. So really the key here is that perfect balance of the right number of images, but also the right images to improve user experience um, and eliminating those parts of images that can be detrimental to your page value. Um, And we'll talk about a few of those in a second. So step number one to selecting the right image, obviously you need at least one uh, to to select the right image, uh, is you want to select photos that fit or images that fit. Yes. So you don't want to add an image to a page just to add one, right? You're you're writing an article about how to beat uh, Super Mario Brothers in under 10 minutes, and then you put a big picture of a dog on there. People are going to be like, what the freak is this dog here for? I, I don't understand. And it can cause them some confusion, cause them to bounce back, and that creates a huge uh, bounce rate problem, right? That's right. Yeah. And, you know, make sure that you find professional looking images that are relevant to your con- content. Um, you can find these from a number of different databases. We've used many different versions in the past. Um, Flickr is one, F-L-I-C-K-R. Um, and also another site's called 500px. Um, they're basically image databases with a wide selection of high quality photos. And you can filter by license to make sure that the images you want to use, you can do so mm-hmm. legally. And if you're somebody who wants to make your images a little more um, around your website, a little customized around your website, you can use Canva. Canva has a bunch of different uh, templates you can use with background images. You could put your own words inside the image to make it look kind of nice. People are using it a lot for Instagram and Facebook, but you can also use it for your blog posts. Uh, there's another tool you can use 
is called Pick Monkey. Uh, that also works the same. We at uh, Squirrel often use a, a site called Unsplash, which has great licensing, so you don't have to worry about somebody coming back to you later going, I need you to pay me $5. You used my image of Homer Simpson, you terrible people. Right? I don't think you'll find any images of Homer Simpson on Unsplash, but yes, that's a... Uh, but you will on Squirrel. That's you got to hunt it down and you'll find it. <laughs> I don't. I don't think you will. There. It's either. on the. P, it's in the, in the PR piece. Yeah, oh. There's p- literally a picture of Homer Simpson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. So thanks for calling that out yeah. so that we can you know get contacted. It's by a Homer relevant image oh, for that right. blog post. Perfect. Okay. So a tip here though is make sure that you avoid using those super obvious stock images. Those are super just terrible everybody recognizes them it's better not to include an image at all than to use like some cheesy stock image um we actually included an example of a cheesy stock image on our show notes yes of a uh random dude in a suit standing in front of some other dudes in suits standing around talking well actually some ladies too it's very clear that it's a stock image just yeah don't do it people those have no real value when it comes to your blogs and or content so once you've selected the right image, uh, don't just slap it up there on your blog and go, ah, we're, we're complete. complete. Uh, instead, step number two, you want to reduce the file size. And so any any website these days that takes longer than two seconds to load, you're often going to get a bigger bounce rate. Mm. Um, if you take a look at your, um, we have a graph on the show notes that shows uh, the ranking of a page based on its load speed. Comparatively, yeah. yeah. So it's basically like for... Uh, any given search results, how quickly the first returned result loaded versus as it went into like numbers 10 and further. And so the longer that it took the page to load, you can see really clearly on the graph, the further it drops in its search engine placement or search engine result page placement SERPs. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and obviously images are going to be relatively graphic heavy. That means they've got more kilobytes in them and that means it's going to take longer for it to load. So if you put a bunch of big images on your page, it's going to slow everything down and then you're going to get uh, dinged by Google for that. So what you want to do instead is reduce that image size as much as you can. And there's a couple of tools we recommend. One is called Image Optimizer. You can use that and it'll reduce the size or compress JPEG. It's compress JPEG. Uh, you can basically put those images in there, compress them, and then take a look at what the altered image looks like and make yeah. sure that it's not too pixelated or that the black suddenly doesn't look black anymore or whatever and make sure that it's a good, still a good crisp quality. Yeah, because sometimes compressing a file can make the image quality on your completed site page look poor and then I don't think that's really worth the trade-off there. Yeah. You kind of have to find that perfect balance. Yeah. And if you're using WordPress, you can use a WordPress plugin like uh, Kraken Image Optimizer or, I love this one, WP Smoosh. Smoosh. WP Smoosh. Smoosh Smoosh them. Uh, anyway, what those will do is those will also reduce the kilobits of the, of the image size. That way it'll load faster. Perfect. Step number three, include social sharing options. So, um, This is really helpful when it comes to getting your image um, more visibility, more traction. Um, People these days, if they're going to share your content, are going to do so um, because you have an image that they're more interested in sharing with their friends or followers. Um, It's really not as common for somebody to take a text-only blog post or a text-only content piece of any nature and share that unless they're like snipping just a quote from it. Um, Again, people are really drawn to images. It's something that stand out to us and that's more likely to be shared. Um, In fact, GoGolf, which is a Dubai-based web design company, found that the bulk of shared content on social networks is images. So um, pictures were shared 43% of the time um, versus opinions that was only 26. And frankly, I've used social media and that stumble, I was, that was shocking, that statistic there, (laughs) that people put pictures on more than opinions. But um, so just kind of interesting to keep in mind that um, if you're going to include images, make it really easy for people to share the image itself um, by including a link uh, to be shareable on the image itself. It's also how you build the page itself. Um, you can get certain plugins on WordPress or whatever landing page uh, service you're using that will format the page when it is shared. So that way the image is part of the shared 
section, right? So it's kind of it, you create the snippet directly in the in the plugins. That way, if somebody clicks, oh, I'm going to share this to Facebook. It's not just text and a headline, and that's all they get. It yeah. actually will format the pic- picture exactly the way you want it, so that way it looks a little nicer. And I would say here that you want to make sure and tie this to your most relevant image. So if you've got you know a post with some funny little cartoons that you just thought were you know fun to include and relevant in context, but you've got one image that really kind of summarizes your post better than others, go with the summary image. Um, So this is um, actually, we included an example in the show notes of a site that did this uh, relatively well that was Design Bloom, and they basically took one of their really nice images. It's a floral design company, and so it's um, got, you know, a really well laid out image that includes something relevant to their site and they put their social share options um, right on the image itself so it was easy for the viewer to just click right on the image and actually choose to share to whatever site they wanted to share to yeah and obviously encouraging your users to share images will attract more users which means more traffic which means that you get higher rank and a boost in your seo especially if those people stick around for a little while on your page and um, also an image will increase the likelihood that your post gets wider distribution for those same reasons. Yeah. Mashable actually found that tweets using picktwitter.com, which is, I guess, the way to attach images in Twitter, were 94% more likely to get retweeted than those without an image. So that's like huge if you feel like Twitter is a way to reach your audience. You're going to want to make sure that you include images and then you include them properly. <laughs> Step number four for optimizing images for user experience is host images on your own servers. Um, I know that it's really, really tempting to host your images, particularly because of their file size, somewhere else other than on your own site. Um, I know there's a number of benefits here. Um, You can serve your own storage space. You might be able to opt in for a lower price site hosting. Um, It's tempting, particularly with some of these image sharing communities that are really popular, like Imager and PostImage. Um, there's, they have like 1.5 million images on these hosting sites. And so you know that the users already trust the platform. So again, I can get why it would be really tempting. Yeah. But it is risky. Um, it puts your image at the mercy of another site's priorities. So if you know that site takes the image down, if it um, reduces the file by compressing it because it's too large, all of these things affect how that image appears on your page. And that can cause you to get a broken link. It can yep. cause you to have the image appear pixelated. Um, and all of this is stuff that, I mean, particularly if it's on a post that you posted and you looked at and you said, okay, everything's great, work complete. And then you don't come to that page again, but you still have people linking to it or visiting it for you know good reasons. Yeah. If that image in the future gets affected, it's going to affect the entire user experience on that page. Yeah. And they can even, I mean, you're talking about moving the moving the image. If they do several redirects and it takes forever for that image to load, it can really slow down your page's load time, which then affects your SEO. And there you go. You're right back to it again. So yeah. we recommend that you host the images on your own site. So that way you can keep control of them. Um, also, so you don't have to worry about somebody replacing the image with something else that's yeah. not relevant. So all of a sudden you're reading this thing about ice cream and all the greatest flavors they have at 31 Flavors. And you're like, oh, this is really great. And then all of a sudden, bam, there's a picture of like something completely irrelevant. Yes. And you're like, whoa, I didn't expect that. And so if you're referring to an image that's posted on another site, like maybe another website that you're referring to in your post, um, instead of choosing to post the image that's hosted on the other site, um, capture the image itself and just source the image so that mm-hmm. you're not stealing that image or saying that it's yours, um, but you will still have control over how the image appears on your own page. Okay, so now we're going to get into talking about how to optimize your images for search crawling. So we talked about user experience. Now it's about search crawling. And there's four steps to this. Uh-huh. Guess what? If you add four and four together, guess how many steps you get? I don't Freaking even know. Freaking eight. Eight steps. Wow. It's right. crazy math right there today. Right. Okay. So search engine spiders can only read text on a page, mm-hmm. but this doesn't mean that your images are invisible to them. Spiders look for text-based descriptions to make sense of your images. And this helps search engines like Google to better understand your page. And it also allows for your images to show up on searches made using the Google Images tab, which then it can allow people to click the image and link to your actual source material. 
So step number one for optimizing your images for Google crawler or search engine crawlers is include keywords in your image names. Now, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll source a bunch of images, we'll go to Unsplash or we'll go to Flickr, we'll find some images, and then whatever our computer saves that image name as, that's what we just use on the blog post. We just don't even care. Whatever that file name is, it doesn't matter. Well, it actually does matter because Google is using the name of the file to sort of describe what the image is. It's just one of the factors that they're using. And if you go to Google's image publishing guidelines, which we'll link to in the show notes, you can read it in there. And they say that you wanna include at least one keyword mm -hmm. in the image to kind of describe what it is. Don't bother with words like a or the, like a puppy doing the thing, whatever. Yeah. You could just say it's puppy fetching toy, yeah. right? You, you don't need to make it like perfect English. Um, and instead of using underscores, which we do puppy underscore grabs underscore ball, according to Google, uh, that's not good. You want to use dashes in between. So it should be Google or it should be puppy dash ball, whatever. Well, actually, it's interesting. I'm not sure if Google even specifies that, but um, Matt Cuts. Uh, Matt Cuts is the the uh, head of spam uh, at Google. And what he what he, his main job is, is let's say uh, you do a search for, uh, you know, puppies playing with balls online. Mm -hmm. His job is to make sure that there aren't Viagra ads in those searches. Gotcha. So he's looking for people that are spamming, doing really spammy things or or uh, or really just uh, abusing Google and trying to get their pages to rank for relevant searches that aren't really useful to the user. That's what Matt Cutts' main job is. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that helps to understand why his blog would be going over something like this because yes. I was like, well, whoever this guy is um, said something really <laughs> interesting. So he basically explained that if you have a URL that's basically word one underscore word two, Google is only going to return that page if the user actually searches word one underscore word two, which like is never going to happen. Whereas if you have a URL like word one dash word two, then that page is going to be returned for searches for word one, word two, and even word one, word two. So it allows that image to get returned in a larger number and a larger variety of searches. So um, it's really, that's as random as it seems, that underscore versus dash issue is actually really important. Yeah, and that, that's been something that, that SEOs have been arguing about for years. So when Matt kind of said that, it kind of made more sense. Uh -huh. And so now you see all the URLs have dashes instead of underscores. Makes sense. But it's more than just for URLs. It's also for file names. And so uh, to give you an example, Labrador, let's say you have a picture of a Labrador Labrador sleeping and mm -hmm. it's a puppy, you would say Labrador dash sleeping dash puppy. That's good. Uh, but IMG00229, well, that's bad. Yeah. No that, that gives you no idea what that picture is about. All right. So number two, pay close attention to your alt text. Um, how is alt text different than your picture name? So when you, when you uh, look at an image in the HTML, it says this is where the image is located and this is the name of it. The alt text is used in case that image doesn't show or if somebody's using like site assistance, uh, like they, they, have a, they have a site imp imp impairment and they're trying to have the page read to them by their browser, the alt text is what's used. So yeah, okay. it doesn't say, oh, it doesn't say like, yo, there's a, a link to an image and the image file name is blah, blah, blah. It just says picture of a puppy or whatever your alt text is. Okay. And a lot of uh, SEOs will use this, they'll toss their keyword in there, but they'll kind of do what's called an, uh, an optimization penalty where they'll name every picture on the page the exact same keyword because they're trying to optimize for that keyword. And wow. that's bad. You don't want to do that. You still want to do very similar to what you were doing with the file name is you want to add that to the uh, alt text. text. Yeah, you, you want them to be relatively similar and you want them to be descriptive of what the picture is. Mm -hmm. Remember, Google isn't so stupid that if you only use the same keyword over and over and over again, it'll rank you. What they're looking for is LSI. They're looking for other words that would normally surround that keyword in order to consider its relevance. So if you're talking about puppies and puppy training and things like that, and you have a picture of a puppy sleeping, Google goes, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense for that to be on the page. But if every image on your page is called puppy training, they're going to be like, no, well, that's BS. Yeah, not every not image every on image your... is puppy training. Exactly. <laughs> so it's interesting because um, you basically can use your alt text to give more detail. And it's 
ideal to tie your alt text to a phrase that a searcher might actually use when looking for either your image or even just your content that the image is tied to. So for example, if you have an image of a 2012 Ford Mustang um, and you've saved it and tagged it appropriately for your page itself, you could add an alt text that describes the um, specific model number and the color, yeah. for example, so that that way you can use your alt text to be uh, like your keyword, but also a bit more descriptive. Yeah. And in the show notes, we're going to include an image with some alt text for our, you know, apparently favorite example, this uh, this segment, which is the sleeping puppy example. Um, some options of like, the, somebody went through and did like bad, better, great, too much. Um, so too much was like, for example, alt equals puppy, comma, Labrador, comma, Labrador, puppy, comma, sleeping puppy, comma, dog sleeping. It's too much. And They've stuffed that alt tag with as yes. many keywords as they could. And of course, Google's going to see that and go, yeah, this is this is BS. This is stuffing. Yeah. And you're going to end up getting um, penalized by Google instead of it being helpful and actually improving your SEO because your image is going to look like spam. Yeah. And I think I said it before, but just to clarify, when the image doesn't load on your page, for whatever reason, because a poor internet connection or because the image link was broken or whatever, you'll get this alt text will actually show on the page instead of the image. That's why it's called alt text, alternative text to the to the image. Oh, and sense. so if you say something in there that means absolutely nothing or is completely ridiculous or non-descriptive. Or isn't a really helpful user experience exactly. because it's just a bunch of words yeah. delineated by commas. <laughs> All of that can just confuse your user and cause them to bounce. And you, that's the, ultimately what you want to do is you want to make your page useful so they don't leave. And as far as search engine crawlers are concerned, you want to make sure that you're optimizing in a way that Google rewards instead of penalizing. Mm -hmm. Another thing just um, kind of more for user experience, since we mentioned it, was while you're in there, add a title tag to your image as well. Um, it's not going to have a direct impact on your SEO, but it does improve user experience because it lets that user hover over the image and see more information about it, which I know I like to do sometimes. Sneaky. <laughs> Okay, so step number three for optimizing your images for site crawlers is you want to add captions to your images. Now, a caption obviously is just a bit, a little short bit of text that you put below the image and kind of explains what was in there. Mm -hmm. uh, people tend to scan a page rather quickly than read it, and captions kind of allow them to gain some relevance between why is this image here and what is the point of that. I know when I look at pages, I'll look at the headlines, then I'll look at the subheadlines, and then I'll look at the images, and then I often, if there's a caption, read that caption is because usually the caption is describing some complex thing they're talking about in the article and they're using the image to make it a little easier to understand. Yeah, it's like a summary text. In fact, according to Kiss Metrics, on average, captions are 300% more likely to be read than the copy of your main body. So this text is like really important. Mm -hmm. And I know we're talking about it from a context of um, site crawlers, but obviously it also has a big impact on user experience. Yeah. But the warning is you don't want to get carried away if every image on your page, let's say you got 10 images on your page and all of them have captions. That's just a little too much. Nobody's going to read all of those captions. All right, so step number four for optimizing your images for SEO crawlers would be create image sitemaps. Now, at this point, you've probably gotten at least somewhat familiar with a sitemap for your site itself. And that's basically a file where you list all the pages that make up your website. It makes it easier for search crawlers to know um, the basic like structure of your site and what yeah. pages to prioritize. They use... Um, this when they're crawling your site it helps them to better understand your page by them i mean the crawlers um, and it helps you organize your site so that it makes it a little bit more user friendly because you can if you use a site map kind of quickly see that things are going off on these weird branch trees that don't make a lot of sense or maybe you're spending a little too much time in content that is irrelevant to your core goal so um, we include in the show notes an example of what a sitemap can look like. But the interesting thing is that sitemaps um, don't only explain the structure of your site. You can actually create a separate XML sitemap just for your images um, where you'll add metadata information about your images, stuff like subject matter, image type, geographic location, and its licensing rights. Um, and this basically is helpful because it lets you basically like talk to the search engines and tell them exactly what you want to be indexed. And it increases the likelihood that your images will be found, particularly those that might otherwise have been lost, um, such as things like images that were loaded by JavaScript code. Um, so, and we again, we include a sample of what an XML sitemap could look like, um, just for you know a random code snippet, so you can see what that means when mm -hmm. you're creating an 
image specific sitemap. Um, it seems hard, particularly for someone like me who is not a coder, um, but you tell me that it's not that hard because you can use a tool. Yeah, so you can use a tool like XML Site Map Generator. It's free and pretty straightforward and easy to use. Free is um, my favorite, by the way, if you yeah. haven't heard that already. There's an online generator and a WordPress plugin, and uh, there's also a Windows download, so it's fairly easy for you to just launch it and get it done. Uh, if your site is built uh, with a CMS like WordPress, you can check out plugins like Yoast SEO. Uh, it'll generate a sitemap for you automatically uh, and an image sitemap separately. So some last notes about images now that we've gone over our eight steps for um, optimization. Or four plus four steps. Yes, four plus four steps. So some last notes to keep in mind. Images, they have a ton of benefits. You can break down large chunks of text to improve readability. You give readers a mental break so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming for them to just kind of process sentence after sentence of just straight text data. Um, and it also makes your content more engaging and easier to digest. But according to Raven Tools, 78% of all SEO issues stem from images. I mean, that's huge. Dude. So overlooking image SEO is a huge mistake. So every image you add should have a definitive purpose and improve the user experience. Then make sure that search engine crawlers can understand exactly what they're looking at. Uh, only by optimizing for both the user and search engine crawlers will you be able to gain maximum SEO boost for your images. Pretty interesting info today, if I do say so myself. It's because you probably wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Some so, of it, yeah. All of it. But yeah. Looking at all these common site elements and helping site crawlers to better understand your site and pages is what on page SEO is all about. To check out the show notes, which I know we referred to a lot again in this episode, um, and see links to the resources we talked about today, head over to growthmarketeracademy.com. And if you're finding our podcast useful or helpful or cool, mm. uh, make sure you rate us on whatever platform you're listening on, uh, or better yet, leave us a review. Reviews are awesome. Oh, and make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode when we'll be talking about how you can use reviews to dominate local search results. Dominate. I know, it's your favorite word. I'm Ryan Eldridge. And I'm Andrea Eldridge. Thanks for tuning in to Growth Marketer Academy. You realized you just did that all over the video and the text for that last section. You were like flailing your arms about because you had to throw the ball just at the last minute. It's okay. All right, whatever. Oh my. This has been Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. 